Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Taft Street Baptist Church online messages. I'm so grateful that you were able to tune in and watch the videos. Just pray that this will be um, a blessing for you as we do some Christmas devotions during the Christmas holidays. Would you join with me in prayer? Let us ask the Lord to bless this time. Our gracious Lord, we want to thank you uh, for today. We thank you, Lord, for the Christmas holidays as we reflect on the birth of your Son, our Savior. So, Lord, as we open up uh, Scripture and, and study um, this prophecy, I just pray, Lord, that we'll have a better understanding on who Jesus is and what he's done for us. Lord, that we can make Christmas much more meaningful. So thank you, Lord, for your word, for your spirit, and for your love. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. I'm going to read a passage here in Roman, uh, excuse me, in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Isaiah 9, verse 6. And it reads, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I find it absolutely amazing. I am fascinated by the various creative ways on how people can announce the birth of a baby. You have um, the old-fashioned way, I suppose, where um, the wife will take the pregnancy test and show it to the, to the husband, maybe even her parents, how the pregnancy test is positive, and everybody rejoices that she is pregnant. I've seen where grandparents <laughs> receive through the mail uh, the ultrasound. And when they, when they see the ultrasound, they rejoice knowing that their child is, is pregnant with a baby. Um, even with genders, I've seen very creative ways where they'll take balloons and to reveal the gender, they'll pop the balloon and depending on the colors of the confetti, uh, you can know whether it's a boy or a girl. I've also seen the smokes, whether it's a blue smoke for, for a boy or a pink smoke for, for the girl. They, they have a plethora of different ways of revealing and announcing um, the birth of a baby and even its gender. Yet, there is one birth announcement that is unique. I've never seen before, only once. And that is a birth announcement that comes over 700 years before the actual birth. And that is what this is here in Isaiah. The context is the following. In the days of the prophet Isaiah, this is set in the northern regions. Uh, Israel was divided into two regions. You have the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom known as Judah. In the previous chapters, chapter 7 and 8, uh, the southern kingdoms were addressed. But now in chapter 9, we see that the northern kingdom is addressed. And unfortunately, what we have here is a word of warning, a judgment towards the northern kingdom and some of the uh, more northern kingdoms uh, regions. And what we see is that the Assyrians will come and invade the land. Why? Because they were in sin. They were living in sin. Matter of fact, verse 2 explains how they were walking in darkness. In Isaiah 9-2, it reads, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, and those who dwell in the deep, in, in, uh, who dwell in the land of deep darkness, on them has light shined. So though they are walking, in darkness, what we also see promise here is a light. The prophecy is that God will send Israel a light. Well, centuries later, that prophecy was fulfilled in Bethlehem. 
Jesus is the light of the world who penetrated darkness and provided the salvation that you and I needed. This prophecy here in Isaiah 9-6, this is a Christmas prophecy. This is a prophecy about God sending to us the promised Messiah. It is Jesus who is that light. He will be our, he is our Savior. So I've entitled this morning's message, A Christmas Prophecy. A Christmas Prophecy. So if you're taking notes, I've got two points that I would like to share with you. Point number one, I want to talk about the nature of the Messiah. The nature of the Messiah. Once again, as I mentioned, uh, this prophecy was made over 700 years before the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. But when we read carefully this text, we would notice how the prophecy speaks of the Messiah's dual nature. Look at verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. There we have the dual nature of the coming Messiah, at least in the days of Isaiah. We begin with a child is born. Notice that this is in reference to Mary giving birth to Jesus. You know, a baby being born through a virgin. Mary gave birth to baby Jesus, and Jesus was a real baby. Jesus was not some sort of mythical concept. He was not some sort of hybrid, some angelic being. He was a real human being. Uh, so this Christmas prophecy in verse 6, in Isaiah 9, 6, points to the humanity of the coming Messiah, who is Jesus. Jesus was a real human being. And as a human, he had a physical body like you and I, but without sin. Jesus grew physically. He hungered. He thirsted. He got tired, so he, he uh, rested. But also as a human being, he, he had to learn. Uh, he obeyed his parents. He went and celebrated um, a lot of these high holidays. Uh, under his legal father, he learned carpentry. As a human being, Jesus experienced pain, grief. Uh, Jesus wept. And also as a human being, Jesus experienced death on the cross. Jesus was truly human. Jesus was not some sort of remote deity, so sort of distant. No, Jesus was fully human, truly human, one who can identify and sympathize with you and with me. Isaiah's prophecy here, therefore, points to the humanity of the coming Messiah. But not only, not only does it point to the humanity, it also points to his divinity. I want you to notice the contrast here in verse 6. In the wording, he was not only born, but notice that he was given. For to us a child is born, watch this, to us a son is given. So he was given to us, a son was given to us by who? Well, by God the Father. God the Father gave us a son, and the son already existed. Jesus was already the son prior to birth. Before Bethlehem, Jesus was already the son because he was the eternal son of God. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He has no beginning and no end. Now, it is quite possible that the prophet Isaiah may not have fully grasped, fully understood this particular prophecy, but centuries later, uh, when Jesus was born, this prophecy therefore began to make better sense, and therefore is described to Christ rightly so. Uh, in the Messiah, in the prophecy, we notice that the Messiah has a dual nature, and Jesus matches that profile. Jesus is truly human, and Jesus is truly God. He's fully divine. So, point number one. The nature of the Messiah. The nature of the Messiah. 
Point number two, I want to talk about the names of the Messiah. The names of the Messiah. Um, the names of the Messiah here in, in ancient antiquity, names and titles were often used interchangeably. They were used to describe uh, either the character of the person or even the mission of the person. Let me read verse 6 in its entirety. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So let's look at the four names that we have here. The first name that is given to us in order to describe the coming Messiah is Wonderful Counselor. Now, I just want to pause here for a moment uh, to make a very small observation. If you have a King James Version Bible or a New King James Version Bible, you will notice that there's a comma in between the word wonderful and counselor, right? Um, so it, it would read wonderful, comma, counselor, comma, etc. Um, but when we look at the modern translations, they've removed the comma in between wonderful and counselor. And the reason why is because the modern translator, I believe, they just saw the word uh, wonderful as being descriptive of the counselor. And not only that, but it seems to fit the pattern of verse 6. Uh, if you notice how the other nouns have adjectives, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. So anyway, just in case, uh, I just wanted to kind of toss that out there. But here the first name that we have describing the coming Messiah is Wonderful Counselor. That means one who is who gives wise counsel. Have you ever received wise counsel? Maybe you've offered it. Sometimes uh, financially we're not doing well, so we may seek a counselor, somebody who can guide us on how to get out of our financial rut through a plan, maybe teach us how to pay off our mortgage sooner or how to have um, create a savings account. So we seek these counselors to improve in these areas, to receive wise counsel. Uh, maybe it's with our health. Maybe uh, we need to lose weight. Maybe uh, we need to go on a diet. Our sugar or our sodium uh, is out of whack and we need help. We need a dietitian to offer us wise counsel. <coughs> Sometimes we just may be in a place of darkness and uh, we need direction in life. So we seek out a counselor to give us direction. Well, what we ultimately need, and all those resources are great, what we need is the ultimate counselor. We need the wonderful counselor. And beloved, that is Jesus. Jesus' words is filled with so much wisdom, so much wise counsel. He gave answers to the big questions of life. For instance, is there a God, and who is God, and can I know him? Well, Jesus answers that. He also answers personal questions such as, who am I, and what is my purpose in life? You may want to know even today um, whether I should take a job, whether I should date this person. Am I ready to marry? Or is that person who I'm committed to, are they ready to get married? What are the principles here? The Bible is filled with these, with these golden nuggets. From my experience, I've learned that when I've deviated from the Bible, uh, bad things have happened. I've noticed people destroy their lives because they've gone against the principles found in Scripture. We need to seek Jesus and to seek the wise counsel that comes from him because Jesus is the wonderful counselor. He offers up the invitation for us to come follow him and make that a way of life. So the coming Messiah is the wonderful counselor. But secondly here, the second name we see is that he is the mighty God, the mighty God. We all love power, don't we? You love power, I love power. And the reason, one of the reasons why we like power is because we like control. 
But in reality, we know that we're not really in control. We have a little bit of control, but that's about it. Even that is not guaranteed. If you have children, you do your best to raise them. But once your kids reach a certain age at this point, all you can do is pray and leave your doors open to uh, guide them. If you have a job, you can work hard, but even your job doesn't offer guarantees. You can eat healthy and exercise, but even that, there's no guarantee. Uh, beloved, we need to rely on the mighty God. We need to trust him. We need to surrender our petitions to him. Life is filled with problems. We need to go to God in prayer and say, Jesus, you are the mighty God. I surrender my issues to you, my life's problems. I surrender them to you because I can't do it anymore. And God is faithful. Not only with our life's problems, but our sinful problems. There's sins that we struggle with that causes a chasm between us and our loved ones. But also sin causes a chasm between us and God. I hope you've come to Jesus as your Savior, because Jesus will remove your sins uh, that, in the ultimate sense, where we are not judged on Judgment Day. Jesus died on the cross in order to remove our sins once and for all. Not only Jesus as the mighty God deals with our life problems, our sinful problems, but also the death problem as well. When we trust in Jesus, he will raise us from the dead. Because Jesus rose from the dead, and he has the power to raise from the dead. And the reason why he's able to raise us from the dead is because he is truly the mighty God. Not only is he the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, but he is the everlasting Father. Some of your translations may say the eternal Father. Ultimately, we're talking about the Father of eternity. That's a good translation. Please do not confuse this as others have, assuming that when it refers to the coming Messiah, Jesus, and it calls him everlasting father, that he is the father in the New Testament. I know this sounds kind of confusing, but there is a group that does affirm this. And unfortunately, that's a very, it's a confused concept. When Isaiah talks about uh, that the coming Messiah is the everlasting Father. What this is doing is describing his ministry, just like the other names describes his ministry. As a father, he is the originator. So through him, things originate through Christ. Same thing as with Abraham in, in, um, in Genesis chapter 17, verse 4, where it talks about he is um, the father of many nations, meaning that nations came through uh, Abraham. Or in John 8, 44, how he, the devil is the father of lies. The devil originated the lies. Lies came through him. So in the same way, Jesus is the father of eternity, meaning eternal life comes through Christ. Christ is the originator of that. That was his mission. If you come to Jesus, beloved, he'll give you eternal life. He has the power to give that to you. And then finally, we see that uh, the coming Messiah is not only the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, but he is the Prince of Peace. You hear celebrities often talking about um, our need for world peace, and we all want peace. We all want to experience peace. But we can never truly experience true peace until sin is ultimately removed. The reason why we don't have peace is because we have sin. That's the reason why we have wars and violence, divisions. It comes from sin. And where does sin come from? It comes from our hearts. So our hearts need to be changed if we are to experience true peace. We need to learn to trust in God, to obey Him, obey Him and to surrender our frets to him, beloved. And, and just ask the Lord to, Lord, we want to experience true peace in us. Lord, just give us that peace. And we lean on Christ because he is the prince of peace. Have you given your heart to Jesus? As long as we continue to live in sin, we will never experience peace. In conclusion, this wonderful prophecy that was fulfilled when Jesus was born in the city of Bethlehem.
God has given you and I the greatest Christmas gift of all. That is found in Jesus Christ. Do you know him? Do you know his name? His name is Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. His name is Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His name is Jesus. Jesus is God's Christmas gift to you and to me. Beloved, I hope you've received them. Merry Christmas. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, and we ask that for anyone watching this video, Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you will just minister to their hearts now, Lord, no matter what they're going through. Lord, especially those who may have heard of Jesus but have not yet committed. I just pray, Lord, that you would just convict their hearts, open up their eyes, Lord. May they see their need for your grace. May they understand the true meaning of Christmas and why Jesus had to come to earth so he can live, die, and rise again for us. Lord, what a great gift that is. Lord, so I just pray that you will use me and this message to touch the lives of others, that they will bend their knees and, Lord, just surrender it all to you. Lord, I also want to pray for those who do know you but are, are struggling. I pray, Lord, that you'll shift their focus onto you, uh, that they know that you are um, their God, Lord, that you are our rock, Lord. And may we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, Lord, that Jesus is our wonderful counselor. He is our mighty God. He is our everlasting Father. He is uh, the Prince of Peace, Lord. Thank you for Jesus, for he is our light, our Savior, and our friend. Lord, we praise you for your goodness. Lord, thank you, Lord, for this wonderful Christmas gift. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I will see you guys next week. God bless you. Bye-bye.